said, I noticed he put a picture of me up here. <laughs> <laughs> in the other uh, let's see, where's Keith Arterburn? Can you hear? Just talk and I'll turn him. Oh, okay, all right, great. He gave me another little deal here, which is, uh, is new to me, but uh, it, it evidently hooks directly to his, uh, his earphones, so that's, that's kind of neat. Um, <laughs> yeah, we all need one of those. You have to open a concession on this. Well, I, I almost forgot this morning. I was actually down uh, cleaning off plates, and I realized I didn't have a funny for this morning, so I had to run and find one. So this is a, this is a Donnie Come Lately funny. But it, it really uh, works in well with the restoration uh, history because the, uh, the title is Baptizing a Drunk. Okay, you got that baptizing and drunk. <laughs> a man is stumbling through the woods totally drunk when he comes on a preacher baptizing people in the river. He proceeds to walk into the water and subsequently bumps into the preacher. The preacher turns around and is almost overcome by the smell of alcohol, whereupon he asks the drunk, Are you ready to find Jesus? The drunk answered, Yes, I am. So the preacher grabs him and dunks him in the water. He pulls him back up and he asks the drunk, Brother, have you found Jesus? Drunk replies, No, I haven't found Jesus. The preacher, shocked by the answer, dunks him again for a little longer. He pulls him out of the water and asks again, Have you found Jesus, my brother? Drunk answers again, No, I haven't found Jesus. But this time the preacher is at his wit's end and dunks the drunk in the water again. This time he holds him down for about 30 seconds. When he begins kicking his arms and legs, he pulls him up and the, and the preacher asks again, For the love of God, have you found Jesus? The drunk wipes his eyes, catches his breath, and says to the preacher, Are you sure this is where he fell in? <laughs> now we have that out of the way. Let's pray together. Our Father, as we come before you once again today, we thank you for the many blessings, and especially today, we thank you for the blessing of the beautiful weather that you've given us. Uh, we commiserate with those in western Nebraska who still have snow today, and those in Oklahoma who are dealing with the flood waters from yesterday. But we know that all this is in your hands, and we know that uh, you will work through us as your servants to, uh, to reach out to those who are in need and need help. Thank you for the, the message today from Matt, and the idea of being silent witnesses who, uh, who attest to your great power in this world, uh, something that a lot of people don't understand and can see only through the lives of, of your people who have created most of, the, uh, most of the things in this world that are good because you give us all the good and perfect gifts. As we study your word today, please, uh, please help us to learn the lessons that uh, you would have us to know that they would stand out for us. Please also guide us in understanding your word as we apply it to our lives. And at this time also we ask uh, that you be with our families that aren't with us, especially be with our kids and our grandkids. And we ask this all in the name of son, your son Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, I'm going to rush through a lot of things, but before I do I have to talk. But, you know, this idea of unsung heroes that uh, that we're talking about. I, I've kind of mentioned some of these people, I, I wish you could say they're, they're always good people or always bad people so you can find them out, but they're, they're like us. You know, they, they make some good decisions, some bad decisions. This really came, came to me basically because of what we're going to talk about on Friday, and I'm not going to uh, tip that off yet. But the other, uh, the other thing that really made me think about it is, uh, once again, going to Todd Mountjoy's funeral. And while I was there, a gentleman walked up to me and said, I want to tell you about how I came, became a Christian. And he talks about uh, being in church as a, as a young person, being a little bit uh, uh, rebellious at the time, uh, but still going to church on a regular basis. And then after he got a little older, he, he left and went off into a terrible lifestyle and decided later that he would come back. And he said, when I walked into the church building, 
the first person I saw was Mike Biscay. He, uh, he said he was my high school teacher who helped me understand a lot of things. But then I left. And I said, when I came back, he didn't ask me, you know, what I'd done wrong or where my life had been. He, he just said, welcome home, what can I do for you? Mm -hmm. And he said, there wasn't any judgment, there wasn't any recrimination. I was just able to come back. And I thought of the, the prodigal son, but I've been thinking ever since that story of unsung heroes. Uh, you know, in my, you're, you're one of those. Uh, when we talk about these people, though, we see, I, I hope you see that they're real life examples. And that's what I love about the Old Testament. I want to talk about Michael. I'm not going to spend as much time as I want to, because as I was going through the stuff for today, I thought, well, I've got to mention Barzilla. I've got to mention Ahithophel, Ahithophel and uh, uh, Hushai. I've got to, or Hushai, however you say that. I've got to, I've got to mention Shemaiah, I've got, and, it, and the names just kept cropping up, and I thought, how am I going to get all these people in? And the answer is, I'm not. So, but I want to start with Michael, because Michael has been uh, intriguing to me for a long time. Michael has been intriguing to me ever since I heard a preacher several years ago get up and give a sermon on David bringing the ark back to Jerusalem, and he's dancing in front of the ark, and is excited, and Michael... Uh, you know, we're going to read the passage in a minute, but Michael gets upset. He says, you have disgraced yourself in front of all the people, in front of all the servant girls. Uh, you've disgraced. And this preacher went on to give his sermon on the fact that a loving and caring wife always is concerned about the image that her husband has. <laughs> and I thought, I just wanted to go up to the pulpit and say, let's read the Bible first and find out what's going on here because that's not at all what's happening in the story. But it starts out, as we talked about already in, in 1 Samuel uh, 18, where Michael is, is enamored. You know, David is kind of a rock star at an early age. And I imagine there's a lot of young girls who thought, looked, at Mike, or looked at David and thought, boy, he's the man of my dreams. And so... Uh, Saul says, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to give my daughter, and I remember I, I talked about this, uh, I talked about this before, that his desire to give Michael to David is not necessary because he wants to bless David. He, he wants her to be a snare to him. And the way she's going to be a snare to him in his mind is the fact that he's going to tell David, you've got to go kill a hundred Philistines and bring me their foreskins before I will give you my daughter. And uh, you know what? I, I hope those of you who have daughters that you think seriously about what you ask your son-in-laws to do. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to be indelicate, but David goes out with a bunch of his men. They kill a hundred Philistines, and the whole idea is that now David's going to be hated by the Philistines. But it says they bring him, they count him in front of Saul. I won't give you the picture that's in my mind of what's happening here because I don't think they surgically removed the foreskins from the Philistines. I think they brought body parts. And this is probably the grossest thing that I can, can think of. Well, that's how Michael becomes uh, David's bride. And it's shortly after this, of course, that David goes into exile. Michael is given to Paltiel or Palti, uh, which depending on what translation you read there. And for probably 10 years, uh, she and David are not together. During this time, David marries, first of all, a Hinoam, the Jezreelite, and then Abigail. And we know about Abigail from 1 Samuel chapter 25. I, I want to finish up with, uh, with Michael before, before I go on to her. Because the incident you read in 2 Samuel 6 about the ark being brought back to Jerusalem happens probably two years after Michael is returned. And I, we've already talked about that, right? Michael was given back to David because of the, uh, the disagreement that Abner, Abner has to bring Michael back to him uh, to, to get back in David's good graces and his, and his, his, uh, his dethroned at that point. Well, you can imagine if, if Michael has been married to some other guy for eight to 10 years, which is most of her married life at that point, uh, she hadn't been married to, to David that long before she's taken away from him. So, you know, she's kind of set up her, what her life is going to be. 
and all of a sudden she's ripped out of that. You remember her husband follows her, he wants her back, but uh, Abner says, get away from here, or, or bad things are going to happen to you. Now, Michael, at, at one time early on, actually saves David's life, and I think I've got that. Um, Okay. An evil spirit from the Lord came on Saul again as he was sitting in his house with a spear in his hand. David was playing the lyre. Saul tried to pin him to the wall with a spear. This is the second time this has happened, but David eluded him, so he drove the spear in the wall. That night David made good his escape. Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and kill him in the morning. But Michael warned him, if you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So Michael let David down through a window and fled and escaped. Michael took an idol. Interesting, there's an idol in the household. Uh, and laid it on the bed, covering it with a garment, and putting some goat's hair in the head. See, he's Israelites and goat's hair. <coughs> did the same thing with Esau. When Saul sent the men to capture David, Michael said, he's, he's sick. So uh, Saul sent the men back and said, bring him to me on his bed. Let me kill him. But when the men entered, there was the idol in the bed, and the head was, uh, and on the head was some goat's hair. So, Saul said to Michael, why did you deceive me like this? Now, you have to feel a little bit sorry for Michael because she gets passed around. Her father gives away to Palti, uh, and Palti, she's taken away from him and given to, uh, well, first of all, she's given to David, then she's given to Palti, then she's taken from Palti, given back to David. She dies without any children. She dies probably in the palace, uh, you know, in, in the towers, <coughs> being, uh, being one of those people who's performing on Broadway. And Michael, uh, Michael said to Saul, David said to me, let me get away. Why, shouldn't, why should I kill you? In other words, she's saying, I let David escape to save myself because he was going to kill me if I didn't, which isn't true, but it got her out of the fix. This, of course, is when Michael goes to Palti. She's with him for several years. And then when David brings her back, uh, she, is, she is the first lady. Sorry, honey. She is the first lady of the kingdom because she is the first wife. She's the daughter of the previous king. And so she has kind of a uh, ceremonial uh, position in the kingdom. But she and David uh, don't like each other. I, I used to, this was one of my uh, truisms when I was being a student. I could tell how physical a couple on our campus had become by how much they hated each other when they broke up. Uh, I mean, it was just, you could, you could just see it, that uh, they, they'd really gotten too, too familiar with each other, and then when they break up, they've got this person who has <laughs> pretty, in some ways, intimate knowledge of them, and they just hate each other. They can't stand, you know, people leave school because, because of that. And I think that's the relationship you're seeing between Michael and David because they have not been a couple. They are not, in essence, really married, married couple during this time. And so Michael, uh, you know, really, she is always she she grew up in in the household of Saul, who was selected by Samuel, remember, to be the first king of Israel. He was the first one. He didn't ever have a palace, but she was raised uh, in a in a in a setting that really promoted her uh, self-worth. She was an important person. She became an important person. Saul became an important person. And that's how she lived her life. And she thought that was just going to continue with David. Of course, it doesn't. So that's why I think you find when you get to, uh, when you get to 2 Samuel 6, um, and I'll just read this. It says, The ark of the Lord was entering the city of David. Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from the window. And when she saw David... King David, leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. Um, you, know, you know, I talked about couples on campus. You probably know divorced couples who now despise each other. And it's, it's a sad thing when that happens. Not what God intended. When David returned home, Michael, daughter Saul, came out to meet him. I mean, she didn't even wait for him to get inside. <coughs> How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today going around half naked in full view of the slave girls to his servants as any vulgar fellow. David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over 
the Lord's people of Israel. I'll celebrate before the Lord. I'll become even more undignified than this. I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls he spoke of, I will be held in honor. And that's probably the last time they ever have a, any kind of meaningful discussion. Don't know that, but it's probably likely. Like that, uh, that leads us to the other woman. This is, this is now David's third wife, Abigail, in 1 Samuel 25. Uh, you know, I, a lot of this I'm, I'm just going to refer to the text. But 1 Samuel 25, you know the story of Nabal or Nabal. And Nabal, David has run away uh, from Saul at this point. He's out, he's an outlaw out in the country. And he actually is in this, this kingdom which is around a place called Ziph. Um, it's, it's an interesting story and there are a couple things that come from, from this later on. But he's around this community and Nabal has these shepherds taking care of his flocks and he's a wealthy person. And, and David kind of is, uh, is looking after these these flocks and these servants and making sure nothing bad happens to them. He's kind of their protector. And so it finally gets to the point where he needs some provisions. So he sends to Nabal for some provisions and, and the servants come and tell him, you know, David's been looking after us. We've never had any trouble with him. He's asking for some help. Can we give it to him? And Nabal says, who is this son of Jesse? You know, I don't know who this guy is. Um, who is David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their master these days. In other words, here's, here's another derelict guy out on the, on the hills. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I've slaughtered for my shears and give it to men coming from who knows where? You know, so David hasn't uh, really made much of an impression on the ball. Well, the servants then go and tell Abigail. Now, I've talked before about Saul giving Michael as a snare, and you know some of the guys laughed. Women, now it's your chance. Mm -hmm. Abigail, when she hears about this, says, oh my goodness, this is a disaster. She acts quickly. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five seals of roasted grain, 100 cakes of raisins. You know, she, she must have been on bacon all night. <laughs> 200 cakes of fresh figs, and loaded them donkeys. Then she told her servants, go on ahead, I'll follow you. But she didn't tell Saul. When she saw David, she got off her donkey, she bowed down before him, she fell at his feet and said, Pardon your servant, my lord, let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Pay no attention, my lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. He's just like his name. His name means fool. And folly goes with it. In other words, my husband's an idiot. <laughs> and he has no idea what he's doing. Now, women, um, you can draw any parallels there that you want to. But... Nabal actually means fool. Now why in the world you'd name your kid that? Uh, is, but that, that's his name. So David accepts this gift from Abigail. He doesn't do what he intended to do. Abigail goes home. I think I've got that scripture here too. Uh, when, when Abigail went home, Nabal was in the house holding a banquet like that of a king. Now he wouldn't give David any food, but he's invited everybody from the neighborhood. And there's a couple people later we'll see that are probably maybe in this group. One of them may be Ahithophel. Uh, Ahithophel, who we're going to read about later, uh, his name means brother of a fool. <laughs> and so there's a lot of supposition that he is act may actually be Nabal's, Nabal's brother. His son is a guy named Eliam. And I'll keep you in suspense on that, but Eliam becomes important as well. This all plays into what happens to David. He was in high spir spirits and very drunk, so she told him nothing until daybreak then in the morning. When he was sober, his wife told him these things. His heart failed, <laughs> and he became like a stone. About 10 days later, he died. You know, so she saves his life, and it kills him. Uh, and then David sends no for her, says, well, why don't you just marry me? And so Abigail becomes his wife. Now we don't read much about <coughs> Abigail after this, except she's in the list of, of wives of, of David. But it seems like this is the one maybe he should have spent more time with. <laughs> you know, uh, I think Bathsheba comes out uh, is, a, is a pretty wise woman. Michael, obviously, we don't know anything much about Ahinoam. All the other women are just mentioned. But Abigail seems to be a woman who really has her wits about her. And, and makes makes a difference. 
Um, as I look at as I look at these women, you know, Michael wanted David for romance, and that's what got her. Abigail doesn't really approach David in any kind of romantic way, but she's wise and she understands what needs to happen. And and I, I think as you look at these women, and in a lot of ways, uh, you know, uh, there's some parallels here between her and Bathsheba as well. I, I want to go ahead and mention these two guys, and I think I've mentioned Mephibosheth already. He is, uh, he is Saul's, uh, he's Saul's grandson. And you may remember in 2 Samuel 4.4, 4, this is where we first read about him. Jonathan, son of Saul, had a, a son who was lame, lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul, about Saul and Jonathan being killed in battle, came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled, but she dropped him and broke both his legs. And so he, he was disabled. He was lame in both feet from that point on. Now, he is hidden by this nurse and whoever is in her contacts. So in 2 Samuel chapter 9, David asks, is there anyone in Saul's family, specifically in Jonathan's family, because remember, David and Jonathan were very close to each other, that I can honor uh, in remembrance of these people. And Ziba, who was a servant in Saul's household, is still around. He is brought to David, and he says, well, there is one kid left of, of the family line. His name is Mephibosheth. And so David has Mephibosheth brought to David. Say Mephibosheth real quick. <laughs> I need to get off this story very quick before I say something bad. But Ziba brings Mephibosheth to David. And Mephibosheth is so humble, he, he, he says, who am I that you should honor me, even by being in your presence, O king? And David says, I want to do this because I love Jonathan, and I want to do something for him. And so Mephibosheth is then given all of Saul's holdings. So you know, Saul, wasn't, although he was king of all Israel, he really didn't have a great, great deal of land or a great deal of property. He had basically the home place. And so that now is given to Mephibosheth. And he doesn't live there. He tells Ziba, who has, I think, uh, seven sons and 20 servants. I don't remember the numbers. He says, I want you to go take care of this piece of land and farm it. But all the proceeds go to Mephibosheth, who's going to sit at my table and live in the palace with me. And so he takes Mephibosheth. And, Brings him to the palace. In 2 Samuel 16, Absalom's rebellion takes place. And when that, uh, when that happens, it, it changes everything. Mephibosheth does not leave Jerusalem. In fact, when you look at, uh, let's see if it's 15 or 16. Well, I'll, I'll just tell the story and look at 2 Samuel 16. And then. You have this bunch of people that we're going to look at today that approach David as he runs out of Jerusalem. You know, Absalom has come in and, and taken over, or at least they, they know he's coming. So they encourage David, get out of town now before this happens so you can have, uh, you can have some peace. And as he goes, Several things. Zadok, the priest, goes with him and brings the Ark of the Covenant. And David says, no, take that back. That needs to stay in Jerusalem. You know, that's God's city. And basically saying, if God wants this to happen, and he wants Absalom to be the king, the Ark still needs to remain in, in Jerusalem. I mean, David is so humble at this point. You know, he's, he's it, it kind of, uh, th this is probably a little more personal than I want to get, but last summer, summer before this one, uh, I was approached by uh, another private school here in Nebraska. And uh, the president said, well, I'm leaving, and I'd like you to apply for the, for the job. And I said, you know, I've never, I'm not going to do that because I've never applied for a job yet. God will put me where he wants me. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, is this God trying to move me out of the way because he's ready for something else to happen at York? And it wasn't really 
what I wanted to do. It wasn't really a direction I was looking at. But I, I think of David in this regard because he was, he was never going to count out what God's will was. And maybe this is what God wanted to have happen. So anyways, he's going along, several things happen. There are people who come to him. One is Husha, Hush, Hushaya, H-U-S-H-A-I. And Hushaya is, uh, says, King, I want to go with you. And David says to him, go back into Jerusalem and become an advisor to Absalom and confound the advice of Ahithophel. Now, let me see where I am in my slides because I'm probably getting ahead of myself and that's okay, but I want to make sure I get all these people in here. Um, This guy. Actually, Barzilla, Barzillai, is the reason. Another reason I decided on this whole series. We may not get to talk about. It. So anyway, uh, <laughs> Hittophel and Husha, first, Second Samuel, fifteen, sixteen, and seventeen. You have this. You have this picture of David running away. People are kind of coming out. Of, people that are faithful to him are coming out of the woodwork. But he doesn't have the support of the masses of people because remember Absalom has now won them all over. They think he's the he's the young, good-looking guy who's going to be the next next king, and, and everybody's excited about that. David's kind of aged; he hadn't been out much. He he's kind of lost contact with his people. But as he leaves, there's this this bunch of people that come out and talk to him. One of them is Hushaya. Hushaya, you know, is, is told go back and be with Absalom and help confound the advice of Ahithophel. Now, Ahithophel is called the king's counselor in, in 1 Chronicles 27, verse 33. We don't know exactly if that was an official position or it was just something, because it says about Ahithophel in, in the passages here that hearing from Ahithophel was like talking to God. Whatever he said was considered the right advice. He was the wisest man in Israel. And he goes over to Absalom. And a lot of people have questions about that. Let me talk about the, the, uh, the connection here. His name means brother of a fool. And so a lot of people think he may be related to, to Nabal. And he may have a couple of things now that are, that are pushing, his, uh, pushing his buttons. Um, he comes from that same region. May have been at that feast that we were talking about. He's the father of a guy named Eliam. And Eliam is the father of Bathsheba. Now, Ahithophel is Bathsheba's grandfather, living in the palace, advising David. Do you suppose he doesn't know anything about what went on with David and Bathsheba? Suppose he doesn't know anything that went on with having his son-in-law put in the front of the battle and killed. So this is this is basically assumption because we don't know this. But there's a good reason that there may be some motive behind him going over to Absalom because he's, he's got bitterness in his heart against David. Very possible has bitterness in his heart. And so he goes over to Absalom because he's going to help there be a regime change. And he then can, can uh, you know, serve, serve Absalom. Now, how this works out. First of all, Hittophel goes, and I, this is all in... Samuel 6, 7, 15, 16, 17. And I'll just, just mention this. I won't read the passage. I have a plan. But Ahithophel, first of all, tells Absalom, the first thing you need to do is go in and have intercourse with your father's concubines that he left to take care of the palace. When David leaves, he has ten concubines that he says, you stay here and take care of things till I get back. So he, he thinks he's coming back. So the first thing that Hittophel says is, you go desecrate your father's concubines. And so he goes and he has intercourse with all ten of the concubines, establishes himself, you know, uh, this is what I think of my father, you know, I'm, I'm just going to sleep with his wives. Then he asks Ahithophel, what should I do now? And Ahithophel says, you need to pursue David quickly. 
before he gets established and gets his fighting men together and the kingdom is yours. Well, uh, Hushiah has shown up by this time. And so Absalom asked him, Hushiah, what, sh what should I do? And Hushiah says, Ahithophel's wrong. He's usually right on target, but he's given the wrong advice. Now remember, David has sent Hushiah back to confound the advice of Ahithophel. And Hushiah says, David has some fierce fighters with him. And if you attack him right now, they're going to do everything to protect their king, and you will lose the battle. You need to get time to get your armies together before you pursue David. And that's the thing that allows David to save his kingdom, the advice of Hushai. Uh, so Hittophel, you know, is, uh, he, here, here's another case in point, who probably gave great advice to the king all his life, but if we're right about the assumption of the bitterness in his heart, it, it takes away the wisdom that he has and the ability that he has to make wise choices, and he chooses the wrong side. I mean, he goes, he goes with Absalom. Uh, you, you see these guys like, now, at, at the same time, let's see if the bill, I'll, I'll just talk about it. Uh, during the same time, as David is leaving, there's a guy named uh, Shemaiah. And as he's leaving uh, Jerusalem, Shemaiah uh, is, is on the opposite hill and he's throwing rocks at David. He's calling him names. He's saying, you know, it's about time they got rid of you. you yeah, yeah, and he just, he berates him. Now later, after David comes back, uh, uh, Shemaiah comes and prostrates himself before David and said, oh man, I'm so sorry. You know, and and uh, Abishiah, who's one of his generals, the brother of Joab, says, let me go kill this guy. And the only reason I mention it is because David's whole period says, what am I going to do with you sons of Zariah? <laughs> you know, you're, you're a thorn in my side every time I, every time I try to do something. And so here, here again is, is that situation coming. So Mephibosheth comes back with Ziba. As David is, is fleeing, Ziba comes up to him. And it's kind of like uh, Abigail. She bring, he brings a whole bunch of cooked food and uh, you know, just a smorgasbord of stuff. And, and David said, well, why are, you, why are you doing this? He said, well, because you're, you're the anointed one of God, and I want to honor you. And he says, well, where is Mephibosheth? And he says, Mephibosheth has stayed in Jerusalem because he expects to be the king. He's the grandson of Saul, and he thinks if he stays here, he'll be, he'll be crowned king. And David at that point says, Ziba, I'm giving all his lands to you. You now own everything that you've been taking care of for Mephibosheth. Um, David, when he comes back, says Mephibosheth comes up to him. And obviously, he's fallen on hard times. His hair is unkempt. He's got a beard. His clothes are tattered. Uh, and David said, why didn't you flee with me? And Mephibosheth said, how can I do that? I would have just held you up because I'm lame in both legs and I can't. So I stayed here rather than slow you down. And so David calls Ziba and says, now what you told me doesn't seem to quite hold water. And and so David does something I think is unusual. He divides the inheritance. Uh, he inherently divides the land and tells Ziba, okay, half of it's now yours and the other half still belongs to Mephibosheth. Now Mephibosheth still lives in the, in the palace. He doesn't actually farm any of this land. He just gets the proceeds from it. But I think here's, here's the case. And, and when you read through, there's a couple other people that, that uh, so uh, it, Ittai the Gittite. You know, I mentioned him the other day. I thought it would be a great name for a rap song. Yeah. Um, Ittai the Gittite uh, has just left his country, probably because of political turmoil. He brings an army with him of, I think, uh, three or 600 men. I'm not sure how many in the army. And he has just come to David, and when David flees, he goes with him. And David says to him, this is interesting to me, because he says to, to Ittai, why don't you go back to Jerusalem? Because you didn't come to follow me, you came to serve God. And Ittai says, no, he said, uh, I, I want to be with you because 
you're the anointed one, you're the one I came to follow, et cetera, et cetera. And so he goes and he fights, he becomes one of David's mighty men, and his, his forces are responsible for helping to win, win back the, uh, uh, the kingdom eventually. And then there's also Barzilla. Uh, let me see if I can find my passage about Barzilla. Um, Steve, I still don't understand how you remember all these names. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, because I read them this morning. <laughs> ah, here we go. In First, uh, excuse me, Second Samuel 19. This this is one of the intriguing people that made me want to start looking at this in the first place. Because I've never really heard of Barzilla before. You know, if you're like me, you read through this and say, well, I just got to get through this and get into something that's interesting because all these names and all these places just kind of jumble together. And so in, in first, uh, first Samuel 19, starting in verse uh, 31, Barzilla the Gileadite also came down from Rokelin to cross the Jordan with the king and to send him on his way. And this is when he's going back. Now, Barzilla was very old, 80 years of age. You know, when life expects you back this time, it's usually around 40, 50, it's pretty old. He had provided the king during his stay in Manahan, where he was a very wealthy man. The king said to Barzilla, cross over with me and stay with me in Jerusalem, and I'll take care of you. Barzilla answered the king, how many more years will I live that I should go up to Jerusalem with the king? I'm now 80 years old. Can I tell the difference between what is enjoyable and what is not? Can your servant taste what he eats and drinks? Any of you there? You kind of mean, you know. um, can I still hear the voices of male and female singers? Why should your servant be an added burden to the, my lord the king? Your servant will cross over the Jordan with the king for a short distance, but why should the king reward me in this way? Let your servant return that I may die in my own town near the tomb of my father and mother. But here is uh, your servant Kenan, let him cross over with you, with the Lord and King, do whatever you wish. The king said, Kenan shall cross over with me, and I will do for him whatever you wish, and anything you desire from me, I will also do. So, I, I, I thought this was pretty pretty interesting for a couple of reasons. The reason this, this struck me is I have a couple of friends who are getting up there in age. Uh, I'm getting up there in age. But I, I look at them, and they're people who have had some some measure of fame or renown during their lives, either as speakers or writers or whatever. And as they're approaching their, their 80s in one case and 90s in another case, I can see them struggling with the fact that people don't want to listen to them. And what, what I wish they would realize is the thing, the thing that seemed to drive them was not the message that they were giving as much as it was the recognition that they received were giving the message. Now, when I saw Barzillai and I, I looked at what he was saying to David, I thought, this is, this is a pretty wise and phenomenal man. Because I, I, I don't know where you are in your life, but, you know, uh, my wife, who's older than I, and I are both you know, 68 this year. And you look at things a lot differently at that age than I did at 25 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 60. Because, you know, as I tell people a lot of times, I'm on the downhill side of my career. You know, I don't know what's going to happen next. But I read about a lot of people saying, here is the legacy that I want to leave. And I think, that's up to God. You know, there are people who are famous who, you know, Abraham Lincoln will always be someone remembered in this country because of what he did and how he did it. But I doubt whether Abraham Lincoln sat down and said, you know, here's what I want people to remember about me. He didn't free the slaves because he wanted people to remember him. He freed the slaves because it was the right thing to do. And, and, I, and I look at that and I see people who are bound and determined. Here's Barzilla who comes up. He's very wealthy. He's basically, we don't know all he did, but he kind of took care of David for a long period of time. And, and David says, let me honor you. And Barzilla says, I don't need any of that. 
want to go home, start a fire in the fireplace, watch Downton Abbey, <laughs> and, just, uh, and, and just enjoy, enjoy it. <coughs> and that's, uh, that's, that's kind of what he, what he does. Now, once again, all these people, uh, you look at the, all their interactions, and, and you realize that the same thing that's happening now was happening then. The same kind of things going on in people's lives, and, and I, I hope we all realize. I, when I used to teach uh, teach Bible with Love Christian, I used to have a struggle when I got to Solomon. Because Solomon is responsible any idol or any uh, other god that you wanted to find on the face of the earth was where? In Jerusalem. And most of them had temples there. And Solomon was single-handedly responsible for people falling away from God as their leader. He had a great kingdom. He was very rich. And I, 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 can't, I can't speak for God, of course, but I wonder if Solomon can go to heaven. Who can't? I mean, but you look at these people and, and you look at their lives and praise God for His grace and the fact that we all make horrible decisions. We get crossways with people. We get crossways with churches. You know, I remember when I was, I was in admissions at the Love of Christian, one, one year a young lady came to see me. Things are much different now. But she came and said, I'd really like to go to school here, but I have to tell you, I'm not a member in good standing of the church. And I thought that meant, of course, that she'd fallen away and wasn't coming anymore. And I said, so what do you mean by that? She said, well, I got married, and about two weeks after we got married, my husband said, I don't want to be married anymore. And he just got up and left me and divorced me. So the elders have told me that I can't ever teach a Bible class. I'm not supposed to ask questions during adult classes. I have to kind of sit in the back door for him and just, and I said, bless your heart. Who in the world? You know, I, I, I remember one time also I had a discussion with an elder who who's, was talking about a, a preacher who had fallen from grace, divorced his wife, married someone else, and was now wanting to place membership. He said the elders met and told him he couldn't place membership. And I said, why is that? And he said, because as elders, we're supposed to protect the purity of the church. And the first thing that came to mind, which I said out loud, is I thought that was Jesus' job. <laughs> but you know, sometimes through history and through the restoration movement, I think you're seeing that, you know, I just finished her at the end of a book called The History of the Church of Christ, which has been so eye-opening to me because it wasn't all as clear as I had been led to believe. <laughs> and there were a lot of debates and a lot of divisions and a lot of things going on. And somehow along the way, we've gotten so judgmental and you know, the, you know, the story of Jesus, the woman taking adultery. Which of us can really uh, make that sin? Here, here at your college, it, it, it uh, manifests itself in some ways that I think are, I, I, I don't know, it's, when a kid is baptized here, usually in the Van Gumpel's hot tub, not in a church building, uh, they think they're Christians. They're not sure they're members of anything. I, I, that's the generation we're living in right now. And, you know, I, I think of that, and basically that's where the Restoration Movement started. I just want to be a Christian. I don't know how all that trap ends up. Well, getting back to these people, when you look at the sinful, despicable lives, and you, you, the most godly man among them was David, who was a jerk. <laughs> and God said, he's a man. Once again, it's not because of what he did. It's because of who he was, the way he approached God, and his humility. And I think, uh, I think that's important for all of us. I've got about five minutes, and I'm going to set you up for what I'm going to do on Friday. Um, 
I, I've really enjoyed this. It wasn't where I, when I started this series. This wasn't where I started. Uh, it, uh, and I probably didn't end up in the right place, but I enjoyed, enjoyed looking at these people. But the ones I want to look at Friday are my favorite, some of my favorite characters in the New Testament. I want to talk about Zachariah and Elizabeth, about Mary, about Anna and Simeon in the temple. And I'm going to give you a highlight of what I'm, what I'm going to say then because, you know, Anna and Simeon, uh, here's this woman who's either been a widow for 84 years or is a widow and is 84 years old. Not sure, we can't tell which in the scripture. But all she does is sit in the temple grounds and sing and praise God and pray all day long. Here, here's, why, here's why I'm going to talk about her and I'm probably doing more of it now but I'll need to do on Friday and get some of them out of the way. But here is the person who I think everybody looked at. You ever seen these preachers? Uh, in West Virginia, there's a guy who always stood, always wore a red shirt, <coughs> waving his Bible in the air, preaching at the top of his lungs, and nobody, of course, ever listened to him. He was crazy. Anna is the crazy preacher. You know, I imagine people came to the temple, there's that crazy old woman. She always sits over there in the corner, and she's always, you know, singing and praising and, and what's so exciting to me is God said there's two people I want to know that the Messiah's come. One's Anna, the other one's Simeon. Make sure these people understand the Messiah is here. And I, I when I did that as, as a Bible teacher, I stopped right there and said your assignment for next week is to go find an unimportant person learn about them, and write down why they are important. Mm -hmm. And I got, I still I still have a bunch of those that I've kept for years. Uh, over 15 years of teaching, you imagine, I got quite a few. Mm -hmm. But some of them were so, so heartwarming about, uh, my granddad was the janitor in our school. And I never would talk to him during the day. Because I didn't want people to know my dad was the champ. My grand granddad was the champ. And, and said, luckily, he's not dead yet. I can fix that. How many people do we walk by, do we work with, who impact our lives, maybe in superficial ways, but there's a depth there? There is, there is something God is using them, whether they know it or not. They're part of the story. They're part of the engagement we have. Um, one thing, I'm, I'm going to start out, uh, one of my favorite people in the Bible is, is Mary. Um, I think we've done Mary an injustice because the Catholics have deified her. And so we've almost ignored her. Yeah. You know, and, and, I, and I look at this, I look at this uh, girl who's probably 13 or 14 years old. And, <laughs> you know, we're, we're all pretty experienced in here, but can you imagine at that age that an angel comes to you at night and said, blessed are you among women? Well, it scared me to death, but, you know. <laughs> and, and, and this woman, just accepts that message. And he says, you're going to be with a child. It's going to be a child that's God most high. And she has the immediate question. I, I was talking about Mary one time in a sermon, and a lady walked out and me up and said, I wish you would quit talking about Mary because I've got a 13-year-old daughter, and she always asks me, Mom, what, what happens if I get pregnant? I said, you need to explain the birds and the bees to her because, yeah. because that story sometimes scares kids. And I never even thought about that before. Anyway, <laughs> the, the, uh, she said, How, how's this going to happen since I've never been with a man? And then there's almost this physical description of how the Holy Spirit is going to come upon her. And, and there's the child you have is going to be born of the Spirit. And what's Mary's reaction? It be. May it be done to me, as you have said. Wow. I mean, who has 
who has the courage and maturity, 13 or 14 years old, uh, to make that kind of a decision? And then, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm using my last few minutes because I, I want to spend more time in exactly like Elizabeth. But then, the angel gives her an out and says, and your relative Elizabeth is also a child. Now, I, I make a lot of assumptions here when I say this. I don't think Mary told anybody. She certainly didn't tell Joseph. You don't think what? I don't think she told anybody. I don't think she told her mother or her father, all of whom have to figure out what's going on. She certainly doesn't tell Joseph. Because what do you do? How are you going to explain this? I mean, I like to say this. Uh, college kids say, when you were 13 and someone came in and said, I'm pregnant, but it's okay, God did it. You know, <laughs> that wasn't any more believable then than it is now. And so she has this out because she can go see Elizabeth. But can you imagine? She can't send a, a wire or a letter or anything to Elizabeth. She just gets up and goes. And can you imagine she's walking up to that door in Jericho or around that, that area? And she's been traveling for a, for a couple of days by herself. And she thinks, what am I going to say? Why am I going to tell, what am I going to tell her I'm here for? I have no, and, and what does God do? <laughs> Elizabeth throws open the door and says, blessed are you, my women. Your baby left in my womb. You're walking up the, walking up the sidewalk. And I think for, for the next six months, three months, next three months, that Mary has probably the best time she's ever had in her and poor Zachariah can't say a word. He's over the corner. <laughs> and these two women are just like this. And, all and, they're, and they're writing songs and they're praising God and they're just having this wonderful time together. Um, and uh, we're out of time, so I'll leave it there and we'll talk about this one.